All right, welcome everyone to the Ethics Village. My name is Shane. I'm one of the founders of the village, and today we have our final talk of the day is uh, concerning teaching, consulting, pen testing, and ethics lessons learned from running a national penetration testing competition. I will um, let the guys introduce themselves, but this is intended to be an interactive session. If you look near you, you should have an ethical slash unethical card. They may ask questions as to your opinion, and if you don't have one, uh, after I'm done announcing them, you can raise your hands and I will hand some more out. Um, and what they'll do is they'll, they'll pose a query to you and ask whether or not you think the scenario is ethical or unethical. Um, if you do have questions or comments about a scenario, I ask that you step up to the microphone because we are recording this uh, for posterity. And so with that, I will let the guys take it away. Okay. So, good evening, good afternoon, everybody. I suppose it depends on what time zone your body or, in my case, my stomach is still in. But um, we are here to talk about, uh, certainly, the ethics of what we have seen interacting with collegiate level students doing a competition. So we've got a really short introduction to give you all some background on what the competition is. We're also going to introduce ourselves as we kind of get to some components of that. And then for the most part, we just have some scenarios. These are things that we've experienced in the last five years of doing the competition. And this is a good size. So expect to start to see everybody else coming up to the microphone or, uh, well, we can't really just have you yell it out because we are recording it. But we really want want to get everyone's uh, involvement. So I know a lot of people in the crowd, so we might be like picking on you and making you come up. Ah, next. So um, the agenda here is, like I said, we're going to talk through what the competition is, uh, we're going to go through the ethics, and then we have some scenarios. So who are we? Uh, my name is Lucas Morris. I am, uh, in my day job, I am a senior manager uh, of the uh, Crow Horwath, or Crow now, uh, that does penetration testing, information security, been doing it for about 15 years. In the auspices of the competition, I am one of the members of the black team that actually builds the infrastructure, builds the world, and runs the competition itself also as a member of the advisory board. Yeah, and I am Tom Kupchak. I, in my real job, I am a director of technical operations at Hurricane Labs. Uh, we basically do Splunk work and I manage the team that does our Splunk implementations and pretend to do other things that happen as needed. Within the competition, I am in the white team and handle a lot of the rules and the operations of the event and basically working with Lucas and other members of the advisory board to give the students the experiences that we're hoping to achieve. We get to share, yay. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Jason, uh, day job, principal consultant for NCC Group, breaking things all day long. Uh, within the competition, I'm on the black team, I help do app dev, so a lot of the times we write super custom apps, uh, and I think we're gonna talk a little bit about some of that in a bit, but. Uh, and I also am part of the pen testing advisory board as well to kind of help set that direction. Hey guys, I'm Dan Borges. Uh, for my day job, I'm an internal red teamer. Um, but for CPTC, I help put together all the OSINT and world um, scenarios. And that's kind of like the context and the flavor of the game. It's the fake employees, it's the operations of the company, um, like the docs and a lot of the storylines. Uh, and then I just wanted to emphasize that there's it takes a village to make this competition. We're just four people representing uh, a lot of people that put in a lot of hard work. Yeah, um, and every year the volunteers grow. There's actually some other volunteers uh, in the audience. So let's talk about the competition here very quickly. We really want to get to our scenarios. So what is it? It is an annual collegiate level penetration testing competition. So what does this mean? Well, we're not a CTF, we're not a defense competition. Those are also very good. But the gap that we saw several years ago was uh, as a consultant, people come out and they're very technical. They know how to do the tools, they know how to build a network, they know how to break into AD or Linux, or something like that. But where they were lacking was interacting with clients, interacting with a business. In internal jobs, they were having a hard time communicating risk to their superiors. So what did we do? We put together a competition where the teams from various universities from around the country, and actually this year will be around the world, uh, come together into various regions and then to a national competition uh, and perform a penetration test. So they are given time inside an environment where we build a fake company, uh, including apps, including hundreds of emails, OSINT profiles, fake servers, and an entire internal environment to attack. 
But the important thing is they're not scored only on their technical competency. There are no flags in the environment. It is simply a, a, basically a corporate environment. And they are scored based on a report, and at Nationals also a presentation to a board, which are executives from our, from our sponsors, that rate them. So if they don't put something in a report, and if they don't communicate it effectively in that report, they get no credit, even if all of the technical details were there. And I really like the last line on here where that's basically the formula for CPTC. We take offensive security, pen testing is the vehicle through which we teach offensive security, uh, but we build a custom environment, especially Jason and Lucas working together to lead that operation. We throw in the business and you get CPTC. Yep. So it's yes. definitely a, a, an equation that we have going on. So this, this isn't really a competition. We treat it like an engagement. We are actually in character most of the time. So if a team comes to us and says, well, how does this work for the competition? We're like, well, what do you mean? This isn't a competition between your folks and our IT team. Like, what, right? what do you this think? Is, this is some yeah. kind of game? This is, we, <laughs> we, we act like we are an executive or an engineer or someone at this company. And so they do test it for, for technical issues. We have a ton of technical issues. Um, but you won't see a ton about this because a lot of the ethical issues that we have come with the interaction and the decisions that the teams make. And it's great because this is a learning ground and a testing ground for them where they can make, and you'll see, some serious mistakes that frankly, at least at my, my job, we would fire someone immediately for that they can then start to talk about. We have a couple of those. We actually focused on more some of the gray area because we wanted to get some good debate for what we have happening. Um, but they do have to communicate. So from a technical perspective, well, each year we do have a different theme. This year, actually, we're, we're doing a bank, so I think there's going to be some really interesting options there. Uh, but every year, there's a lot of environment. The whole apps are custom. Uh, we'll have some off-the-shelf stuff as well. But for example, when we were the hospital, we had an EMR. We had lots of different, we tried to simulate imaging systems and other things uh, and custom apps. And certainly, our sponsors also will throw software at us um, that actually really works out for them getting tested. Uh, for the autonomous vehicles, we actually had car simulators, and Uber was a big sponsor. So there's a big technical component to this, but as I said, there are no flags. We just try and make it a company. So with that, we're not here to talk about the competition itself. If you want to do that, we'll have some stuff. If you want to volunteer later, we can talk about it at the very end. We want to talk about ethics. So we are here to teach these students. That is what we are there to do. And we are teaching them realistically three major objectives. The first is technology. We need, there's a skills gap in cyber, so we need it. But the second is soft skills, interaction. And then the third is decision making and team interaction because there are six students per team uh, with one captain that's a student and a coach. But the coach is not allowed to be engaged during the competition. In fact, they can't talk to them for most of that time. So the teams have an opportunity to be dangerous. It's a simulated environment. Each team actually gets a separate environment. So we do actually spend like 20 grand uh, during the weekend of regionals and for our <coughs> cloud provider, who thankfully is a very positive sponsor of ours, because everyone gets a dip, uh, their own mirrored copy of the company. So they can be dangerous. They will take things down. They will change environments. They will actually, as you'll see in our first scenario, leave red herrings for other teams during the OSINT process uh, and during a bidding process that we make them go through. Um, we don't give them really a lot about scope. They have to discover that themselves. And for those of us that do pen testing, you know scope is important. Taking systems down is very bad. So they now will learn, if they go into consulting, which a small number of the students do, uh, they will have the direct skills. But for those that go into an analyst or an engineering role or something in-house, they now also know how do I be a better customer and how do I be a better communicator to the people that I'm working with. So <laughs> what do we learn through this? Well. A, a lot of stuff. <laughs> a lot of stuff. Technically minded college students, uh, they're, they're really bad at interaction the first time through. I, I know everybody's probably real surprised about that. Um, the scope of work, is it a suggestion? Because they treat it as such. They will regularly plow through limits that we've put together. And I know every single person at this table has said, but I'm a hacker. Rules don't apply to me. So just to point out to you, we dock them points if they go out yes. of scope. And we will actually dock them more points or less points depending on their uh, reaction. If, they, if we walk into a room, sometimes we'll channel angry clients that we've had, and we'll start screaming at them. Not angrily, but we'll be making a tense situation. And if they Lucas say, has a ton of experience with that sort yes. of thing, too. So. <laughs> And I'm generally a very he's, nice person. He's, he's good at being an angry client. Just, you know. <laughs> um, but if they say, we're very sorry, let us look into this, 
they may get points back, especially if they come back with a good answer. They're not all of them, but most. If they say, that's not us, and we have logs, we monitor, we generate 400 gigs worth of data in just the national competition every year, we know. <laughs> they lose all the points. So. Um, are there boundaries for hackers? I think that is a big piece when we think of the ethics of cybersecurity. And what are the boundaries that we have working with our clients, working with our companies, uh, both from a responsible reporting, but how we scope and structure our engagements to make sure they're, they're the best? Yeah, I think a lot of times uh, hackers think if something isn't explicitly denied, then they can get away with it. Um, but when you're working in a client engagement, it's there's, there's unspoken rules of how you interact with the clients. And, and this is a super interesting change of perspective for them because as a community, we've built up this great environment where people can come in and just crap all over everything all the time in CTFs, right? And so they come into this with that mindset of like, I'm just going to bang away and break all the things. And that's not a professional environment at all. So it's a very big mind shift for them to come into a CTF where that doesn't work. And we, we have the rules written in such a way that they are broad. And so there is a board of industry professionals that not only makes decisions on what we do and certainly um, has very little free time putting together this competition throughout the year, but also whenever there's a potential rules violation, some of them are very clear cut. That's not what we want to talk about here today. We want to talk about the ones that are gray because we get together and we build consensus between it's not just this group, but there's often 10 or more of us before we create a rules violation and flag it as such because our rules are broad and we want to try and give them a real world interaction. Also knowing that, frankly, sometimes if you piss a client off, it doesn't matter what you did, you are in the wrong. And we've given ourselves the flexibility to do that. Yep. And we firmly believe that teams might, you know, they treat this as a competition, even though we don't want it to be a competition. So they look for nuances in the rules or things that we haven't considered, and we don't consider that professional. Yep. And we want to make it clear that if that comes up, we have the ability to deal with it, just like a client would. So the way this is going to work, now that we've given you about 10 minutes worth of background here, is you know, there are a lot of challenges that we deal with. Uh, so we have, we have 11 stories. Our hope is to not get through all of them because we want to hear your thoughts. Whether it's raising your card, but more importantly, we'd love to hear your comments at the microphone as we go through these. So the four of us are going to tell a story. Um, we've worked through what ones we wanted to tell, but it'll probably be a little bit of communal storytelling. We're going to keep that short. And then we want to have a discussion around was how... We'll talk about how we responded, but we also want to hear about how would you have responded and where do you think things belong. And, and feel free to like tweak the scenarios, to talk about something a little different if yes. you want. Uh, we definitely want to make this creative and, and get into some good conversation about you know what is acceptable and where do we want to take this competition in the future. Because the idea is these are things that, as industry professionals, you've probably ran into yourself with either clients or personally as a red teamer. So this... Things that we'll be talking about are generally going to be things that you're going to have experience as well. So I think, Dan, you probably are going to be the best one to start this one off. But yeah. so and, then and then you can finish. Yeah. This one was pretty interesting. Um, as part of the OSINT for the competition, we had set up a, a fake company website. The company website linked to multiple social media profiles for fake employees. And then from there, it started going into this crazy social network. At one Point, a bunch of these fake employees were part of a group where they shared an open Slack uh, invitation. So anybody that found this public group on, say, Facebook could now join a private Slack chat, which was the company Slack chat. And this was OSINT before the competition started, and it's public, so anybody can join. Um, and what we had is we had a whole bunch, and then we seeded this chat uh, with a bunch of conversations. So what we had is we had students um, log in, and then where the, the real issue came is instead of just logging in and like uh, learning this information and doing the OSINT, they started to make profiles of the company and seed false data to the other people that were getting the OSINT to throw them off the trail. So um, I think we want to stop right there and just take a poll of the audience with your cards. <laughs> How do you feel about that? I'm seeing a lot of black. This yeah. first one, uh, we, we felt like it was maybe a little more black and white at the beginning. but <laughs> Yes. We got the we easy one. We got, want to make sure everyone understands the system. Everybody's so, in practice. Yeah. Um, so then we had a, another team end up reporting it because they basically found... Uh, 
a bunch of information that they started doing research on and then they found it was open information and not part of our environment. So then they came to us and they said, is this you? You know, it, this, and we told them, no, this is not us. And then we started the investigation, found out it was another team, at which point we had to talk to both teams, the team that found the false information and the, the team that submitted it. So the information itself was something that was uh, not, it was cop not copyrighted, but um, proprietary. owned. It was proprietary. Thank you. And so there were, there were two issues. And again, I'd, I'd like to see the cards before we start the discussion. So the team that found this information, not the team that planted it, but the team that found it, noted, it immediately recognized where it came from. And so their first response actually was to come to us, but in parallel also start going to that organization before they had any information from us and report us for using that information. Yep. So, would like to hear from everybody on this as well. What are your thoughts on that? Was that the ethical decision to immediately go to the, the proprietary company? Or should they have waited until they got information from us? Seeing some black, but it, it yeah. feels yeah. questionable. It, it, yeah. I saw some white, too. Okay. I saw some yeah, white. there was a little bit of white. I, I think you may have said a false dichotomy in your question. Oh, did I? Because you said, should they have immediately reported it to them? or should they have come to us and asked us about it? But what they, I feel they should have done was find out information as to whether or not it was something they should report. Absolutely. So, you know, it's, it's a good uh, question. It was poorly worded on my part. No, it's okay. So somebody with white, come up and tell us why you think that's ethical. Awesome. Yes. Uh, there was ambigu ambiguity for me because I was like, well, depending on what kind of information, this could have been like, holy shit, this is a really bad, you know, is this bad? Guys, this is bad too. And sort of like reporting it to both, both parties. Whether or not they get you in trouble is an aside to, oh, by the way, I found CP, you know, child porn on this website. Sure. I reported to the FBI and you. Let's right. just clarify, this was intellectual property. Yeah, right. this was but, <laughs> no, what, but whatever the intellectual it's a good point. property, it could be of the, holy crap, I'm going to tell both. Sure. Right. Sure. Just, well, okay. Well, ethically, I, and, I and we're trying that. to be a little vague on this yeah, to, a, to keep... Yeah. And innocent so, party's innocent. Yeah. But so, we will say intellectual property, not that other stuff. So just so to make everyone clear. I want to take that example, though, because I've actually run into that example in a pen test where I have found child pornography yep. on my client's network. So let me ask this question. Outside of this context with CPTC, what's the ethical responsibility there? Is the ethical responsibility because you're under, under an NDA, right? So... Am I allowed to go to the FBI, or do I just report it to the client and allow them to escalate it? You're forced to go to the FBI. Yeah. Right. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Do not pass go. Do not collect two hundred dollars. Right. <laughs> so, so from that from that perspective, they kind of did the right thing, right? Like report it to the body that owns the information, and then suss out how it got there and and who owns it. But from from one perspective, right? There's multiple yeah. perspectives here. Yeah. If they were claiming uh, attributes, we're, we're recording. So if you would, sorry. <laughs> Yeah. On the other hand, if they were claiming a specific attribution to you of this violation, that is the unethical thing. Yeah. yeah. Reporting it is completely ethical. Yeah. yeah. So uh, then we started the investigation. Yep. We found out it was a team that was doing this to, to see so, false information for yes. other teams. So we had the IP address of where it came from, and it was an IP address that was most assuredly attributed to a university. And it happened to be a university that was competing. And it was too. happened to be a university that was competing. So circumstantial evidence, but we mm -hmm. called. They came forward when we asked them about it. Yeah, so we called the coach. So a member of the faculty uh, or an employee, the coach has to be. And so we called the coach, and through that process, we actually met with the team. And we met with the team in two ways. So the first 10 minutes or so of the meeting, we just met with their a coach and their captain. So it would be akin to saying maybe we're meeting with the partner and the project manager or something like that in a consulting engagement. And we were entirely in character and asked them, so why is it that we found you planting false information for our uh, other people that are bidding on and working in our environment. And they did a fantastic, actually, they did a very fantastic job of saying, you know what, we did not do that. I did not know about this, but if you believe it's coming from our IP address. I think that's a different scenario. Oh, was it? Yeah, they, oh, they, they admitted fault when we did this. Did they? And okay, they my bad. I, I'm <laughs> combining a couple. Uh, needless to say, over the years, I've had to have a few of these meetings. So <laughs> apologies. <laughs> uh, so they immediately came forward and said, 
it was us. Yeah, and they removed the data. And they removed the data. So our response was to um, dock them points, basically to assess a penalty. Do you want to talk about that, Dom? I would just say that, that we held that as unprofessional behavior. Mm -hmm. And it's no different than if your client discovers you doing something unprofessional, they might fire you, or they might not renew your contract in the future. So very similar to how we held the team accountable in that case. That said, I think once they removed the data, even the group that was going to report to the, the organization, which theoretically would have kicked them out of whatever they were trying to accomplish with that organization, um, didn't. They, it all resolved kind of peacefully, and I don't think mm -hmm. he lost his access to the thing. That's correct. It was a, um, uh, the offending university had uploaded a port scan of a private testing and, uh, you know, a proprietary network that is used for studying. So that's pretty vague. But. Yeah. Next one. So next. Okay. So this is very similar. Um, in this one, we set up uh, LinkedIn profiles for all of our employees, and we set up a fake company. Uh, in this one, we had uh, student teams create fake employees of our company to add them as friends and uh, friend request them on LinkedIn. We didn't really appreciate this from that perspective because let's say we were working at that company, that's not a real employee and we kind of recognize that. So uh, how do you guys feel about uh, ethical or not ethical for someone to do this in a pen testing? I think engagement? we need to clarify that phishing was not part of the scope. Yeah. Yes. Uh, it's just a regular network pen test. Now, all right, it seems pretty hey. universally unethical. Now, what about if phishing, social engineering, security awareness testing was in scope? Pretty ethical. Pretty ethical. Okay. So, so that really shows the importance of scope there. Yeah. And one of the things that, as Lucas was saying, that we try to teach is the importance of sticking to your scope and understanding it. And I would say especially that's one of the boundaries that college students like to push. And um, this kind of gets back to the, the hackers no rules thing. Like, unless we explicitly deny it, they will try it. Um, specifically, they hadn't even been brought in for their intro interviews yet. This was pre-pen test. This was still doing OSINT, and they were impersonating employees of the company. So one of the things we do actually ask them to do is to um, put together a proposal and bid on the work. Uh, it does have a minor component in the score, but in reality, we are not looking, we don't expect them to know how to bid on work, put together proposals. Right? In my professional life, we don't really look at people to do that until they've got a few couple of years of experience. And so what happens is it's more to get them in character. They put together a proposal, and we get some wild bids, like this is a $2 million pen test. We've also had a $150 pen test before. Uh, I really want to go with that one in the future. <laughs> but um, yeah, we, and we give them actually at that component we give them a lot of guidance on we expect to see these items they get a bulleted list to try and help then actually the Friday of the competition we have them sign an engagement letter what that actually is is there's a whole set of non-disclosures and other things for other sponsors and the software they're providing but also photo release and other minor things that you get at any one of these competitions so they were doing this before the official start date of the engagement. So I'd also like to see people's thoughts on ethical, unethical first for simply creating the account but not asking anyone to friend you or do anything. What are your thoughts on that? Is that ethical or is that unethical? It, it was positioned as an employee of the company. Yeah. Okay. So I see, I see lots of black, but let me ask this question. How many of you have a start date on a pen test and the phishing's included and to prep for that pen test before the start date, you go out and create profiles for the company because you know you're going to need them next week when you start this engagement. That's ethical, but it's not ethical for the college kids to do it before that. Why is that different? Please step up to the microphone. Thank you. Quick question. What, what would they gain from that, from starting early? Well, so I know when we do this at work, certainly some efficiency, but the other example I was thinking of is we will also create domains and we will list them and we will start to get them filtered a week or two before we start so that they sit in a filter. Two words, account age. It's very easy to see if an account is two days old versus 
two years old, we rename accounts and continue to reuse them yep. for that purpose. Sure. Very okay, cool. Very cool. So, so I think that tells you what you get out of it, and I don't disagree with you. But then I guess my question still stands. Why is it not okay for the college kids to do that? Everybody held up black for that, but white for pen testers to do that. Why is that different? <laughs> so the question was engagement letter being signed versus start date. Fair enough. If you know your Fair start enough. date is two weeks out, you know your start date is right. two weeks out. So you're prepped for it. I like that. And yeah, you're very correct. We often have our engagement letters signed months in advance sure. or weeks in advance. So that's a good point. Uh, I guess I just wanted to comment on, I don't know if it's a sentiment, sentiment that others share, but there's a difference at least for me between ethical and unethical and then allowed or not allowed. So I yeah. guess of the same hacker mentality, if it's not explicitly said, then I probably would do that as well, but I'd also acknowledge if I was called on, uh, on it that it's unethical. Okay, very cool. And I know, that's actually a very good point. One of the things that I, I think it's a, that's awesome. uh, a, yeah, it's a lesson that we've uh, debated a lot internally to our firm is um, allowed, unallowed, ethical, unethical. And then also the third level is how upset will the client be versus not and who is our client? Because that, their personality may greatly sway how we approach something. So let me ask this question. Should unethical behavior be allowed? in pen testing contract or game contract real world should should because because we're we're designing the game sorry i should use the mic cause for the speaker sorry since we designed the game to reflect real world contract that's our whole goal is we want to get kids exposed to what this life what contracting life is like so we'll say real world should yeah, in, that be in allowed in the of this game those are the same i'm I'm going to say if you talk to the client and you agree with the client on the specific thing that you're emulating, then in that scenario, I think there's value in testing unethical techniques. But I also think the client needs to be aware of that and also give you approval and sign off on that. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely. Because that, that in, makes your approach at least ethical in terms of working with the client. Yes. Exactly, exactly. In this context, would you say that it's more important to be ethical or professional with a client, and what's the difference between the two? Interesting. I would say yes. <laughs> so, I mean, I feel like in, in at least, I, I'm sure this may be different for different people, but for me and, and for what we do at our firm, I, I, those are the same, right? So yeah. something unethical, I do not feel like can be professional. I got to... Uh, but I wanted to make this differentiation earlier when we said like rules versus ethics. I think a lot of times when there's a break of rules, we address that out of character and out of the game. We yeah. say like, should we pause the game? Should we adjust scores? Like, should we correct this somehow? And if it's an unethical decision, we handle that in character in the game yeah. and like kind of just run it to ground and, and f like play with it. So I have a, a comment about some of the terms you've been using and then a question. So as you describe um, this you use the words game and you use the words competition and competition's actually in the title. So words are really important, especially for undergrads who don't have that experience of here's what consulting, here's what contracting is. So as soon as you start using the words game and competition, they're like, oh yeah, yeah. points, we need to win this. So I think unfortunately some of these situations are set up because of the terms that are being used. So I know you probably do a lot of uh, discussion with the teams afterwards. There's a lot of lessons learned, and they're probably like, yeah, you know, that does make sense now that I know about it. Um, what are some of the universities, or what are you all doing beforehand to teach them some of these lessons before it happens so that they have that knowledge so that they can run through it on their own as they're considering doing some of these scenarios? So... Um so I actually think there's a, there's a fair amount that we try to do, but it is actually a very good point that there is a lot more that we can do. Um, so at the beginning of the competition, we, during, as I mentioned, we will have them do like a, a bid and a proposal, and we take time out of character and almost every meeting that we have up until the competition begins to remind them and explain to them, look, here's the differentiation between game and competition and real world. Here's what consulting looks like, and, and uh, there's actually some competitors in the room, so for not doing this, you know, please tell us. But I feel like we we make a best effort to explain the difference to them in as simplistic of terms as possible. And, and but 
I know we can grow. Yeah, I would say one of the emphasis we're doing this year is making sure that there's a conference call that every team can be on in yeah. advance so we set these ground rules in advance. Uh, also, uh, by doing this, we are providing OSINT about the environment and making this recording publicly available, and we expect teams who are interested in competing to watch this and learn about what they're going to be doing. I think also we're meeting with the coaches. We've, we've been meeting with the coaches for months, even though the competition is still months away. Um, and our, our, I don't think we ever clearly set this expectation, and maybe we should, but our, our hope is that the coaches would be going back to the teams and providing that guidance based on the discussions that we're having in those calls. To add into the comment, though, when you're looking at unethical situations, and let's say if we're looking at a company and you're doing your work both nationally and internationally, some international laws could actually put those people into prison. So mm -hmm. that would be a real life scenario where being unethical in that scenario would be bad for them. Sure. So, so to, yeah. just to put it out there, the international component this year, I'm really excited for this because it, it's a Middle Eastern region, and it's going to be interesting to see how they approach things perhaps differently than U.S. students. I'm really kind of excited about this. Yeah. And certainly all of our infrastructure is run locally, so we're not exposing our students to that liability. But, I mean, yeah, we at work have contracts and in, in, in terms in our engagement letters around that exact component but that all said talking about liability and doing things we have a later scenario where yeah teams are coming up with creative ways to potentially do you know cause real risks to them if they were an organization and actually causing risk for us which we unfortunately have to deal with but yeah that's with all in the the joys of running this thing ready to step on yeah i think so cool so Ooh, this yeah this one's want to take yeah take okay. start it no, um so this scenario uh, was really funny. Basically, we started doing the OSINT and we released an email address at one point and somebody emailed us a fork bomb. And I, I, don't, even, I don't even know what they were thinking because like, what do I do, pipe my mail to like a, my command line? No, <laughs> right? So they, they email us a fork bomb and I'm just like, okay, who did this? And they use an anonymous mail service. When you look at the headers of the anonymous mail service, it uh, records the IP address that it was sent from. It was sent from the public IP of a university that was competing in our competition. Yeah, okay. spoil spoiler alert, <laughs> university IPs tr are tracked to you pretty well. It's, it's hard to deny that. So we sent an email to the school at the thing, and we're like, did you send us a fork bomb? Like, <laughs> hello? And they replied, and they were like, no, bro, not us. So, was, so stop real quick. Cards again? Ethical and non-ethical to send a fork bomb to someone. <laughs> no, this is not a joke. This actually happened. It gets better. Oh, it gets better. No, it gets better. So okay, keep going, Dan. Sorry, so Dan. they deny it. It's not them, and we're like, okay. Uh, we have logs. We'd like to see, you know, your logs from that time period, and hopefully we can see if there's any connections or anything. So we start to run it down with the school's IT team, right? Like, this is a, a computer security and forensics competition. Like, we're going to find out. Um, so we start to, yeah, we start to run it down with the IT team, and they're like, yeah, dude, it was their freaking lab. Like, here's the packets, right? And then, so... Uh, at this point, the competition keeps going on, and this is one of those things where they're not really breaking rules, but it's kind of unethical. So we're like, whatever, we'll just deal with this in character. Like, the competition will continue, and we just had these like random meetings with this team to resolve this issue that we were having with them. So by the end of the, the weekend, we have this final meeting with them where we have all of this data that shows these packets were coming from their logs. They had done an independent analysis of their own logs during the competition. This was, this was, this was before the competition. Okay. This okay. one was before. Okay. Sorry, they, we have a lot of these. <laughs> they, they prepared a presentation for us to yes. let us know what happened, and they came in to give this presentation, and they basically doubled down on their lie, and they yep. said they had forensic logs that showed UDP traffic from Mexico accessing their lab <laughs> at the time of this uh, <laughs> fork bomb. So they were like, we basically had these actors in there sending you fork bombs. Yeah, somehow Mexico is targeting this competition that their team happens to be participating in. Even though none of the logs from the institution say this, but so, whatever. So, so ethical we, or unethical, doubling down on your stories. Yeah, black and white, right? 
<laughs> so <laughs> so there's there's a couple other components to this though so as Dan mentioned during the competition they they provided a nice report for us that essentially doubled down ahead of the competition we had another meeting with them and this is the one I was thinking of earlier where uh, the first 10 or 15 minutes or so were with their coach who, who already knew we, we provided him the courtesy ahead of time of just professional courtesy of hey we've seen this happen he's the one that got us in touch with their IT team to do the investigation um, but with the coach and their captain which was a student and the captain actually did a very good job of saying, we are going to do an investigation. Give us a little bit of time to figure this out. We need some time to determine with the additional information you've provided us and RIT team has provided us to really determine what happened. And that, that is an excellent response for that sort of scenario. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that, yeah. So, so I was just Independent saying, investigation, ethical yeah. or unethical? Yeah, pretty straightforward, yeah? Yeah. Okay. So... We then had an out-of-character meeting to discuss this with them as a teachable moment, right? This is an educational piece, so we wanted to just explain from the perspective of actually to, to your comment of professionalism and game versus competition versus consulting, let's talk about the consulting component of this and, and no matter what's happening, right, you have created an issue with your client. So there are some potential ramifications for that. One of the students doubled down in a different way than we expected. So the first thing they said was, something I mentioned earlier, almost verbatim, I'm a hacker, the rules don't apply. So I would, I would like to hear, maybe this is more of a broader comment with the slides, as a hacker, do the rules apply to us in all of the things that we've talked about? There's probably a better way to word this. Like, you mean, it, as a cop, the rules don't apply? I mean. Yeah, so, so we, we all say that, but I have people at my company that I work with that maintain that same attitude, yeah. and maybe it's just because they're fresh out of college. We do hire a lot of young kids straight out of school, but that's an attitude that a lot of people are coming through four years of school in security, and they come out with that attitude. It doesn't matter. I can do what I want because I'm a hacker, and that's what you're paying me for, that mindset, which is true. We are paying them for that mindset. I mean, I, I'm going to go with that's completely unethical, but... It's also a flaw in your hiring process. <laughs> I don't disagree with you. I don't, don't disagree there. So, so should we ask ethics questions as part of our hiring process? Yes. yes. Absolutely. Yes. You should. How many of you do? Oh, yeah. Nice. Good. Good. And I was just going to point out because I, uh, I don't know, I, I've been competing in defense competitions and so on, but. Um, they're not kids; they're students. I'm yes. sorry. Yes. I'm sorry. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so the, the other piece of this was during this meeting, uh, a member of their team, uh, even though the captain was still leading most of the conversation, which again is from a professionalism perspective what we would expect, a member of their team uh, very uh, loudly spoke up, spoke over their captain, and said, it's someone else, I'm not going to name who, that has access to our lab that did this. So I, I think there are two things here I'd really like to see people's comments on. The first is outing someone like that, comments directly, but also does are you as a consultancy still responsible for the things that someone else on your team may do? Absolutely. I feel like yes. Yeah. In our contract, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, if, if someone broke into my company and uh, used our network to attack our clients, contractually, we are most definitely liable. Up. There's no getting around that. Yeah. Next one? Next? Yeah. Okay. Oh, you have a question? Yeah, okay. Hopefully start to get to a little more, some gray stuff here, I think. This one was really funny. Want me to describe it? Yeah. Okay. So this was uh, during our healthcare um, scenario and basically we had a bunch of systems and our emphasis was on high availability. These were systems that were part of uh, healthcare monitoring systems and we really needed to make sure they were up at all times. Anyway, one of these systems was susceptible uh, to the dirty cow privilege escalation. Um, I forget the exact CVE thing, but it was pretty popular uh, the last few years as a Linux LPE. So um, 
the students got access and we we actually had the gambit of responses on this one we had students that didn't talk to us and they were like oh sweet lpe they ran the exploit and the system crashed um and you know it wouldn't come back up on its own and then they had to come talk to us we had students that first reached out to us and said hey this is vulnerable to dirty cow but there's a risk of it not coming back up can i run this we said go for it and then uh we had students that just decided not to run it at all due to the risk so i guess the question here is we'll start with the ones that find the lpe and don't talk to the client is that ethical or unethical assuming no crash Still, there's, there's a possibility of a crash. Correct. There's a possibility, but we're not we're not assuming there was or was not. What's the SOW say? Yeah. It says high availability healthcare systems. Yeah, the, it's no, a it's a you're testing. Oh. Uh, the pen testers, are we testing denial of service? Yes no. Or no? No. 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 Explicitly out of scope. Yes. So I yeah, see. There's point. actually some some different colors coming up here. Some some whites and blacks. So I'd like to to hear from both. Anybody want to take a shot at running the exploit? This almost just feels less like an ethics question and more being bad at your job. <laughs> <laughs> like, that is that is just con contractually bad that you crash the system when you signed a thing saying that you would maintain high availability. Just talk to the client. But there, there are always, there is always a chance that we will crash a system. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. There's so just scanning. some things that have a higher chance than others. Sure, but... What's the threshold? Okay, so let's say you ask to run it and it's a system that's critical for you to get root on to pivot into another network and the healthcare system leaves the determination up to the pen tester. Should the pen tester exploit the system with a chance of taking it down to further their access? Yes, because they've now notified uh, the Use the... Right? <laughs> so I'm going to speak for possibly half of the room. Uh, I have no idea how many people agree with me, but I would say yes, definitely, because you've notified the client. You can tell someone, hey, make sure if you see this system's light stop blinking, go turn it back on. But once you've notified them and they know that it might crash and they say, all right, then it's up to your, your decision, then it's totally ethical at least. It might not be the best idea, but I would say it's at least ethical to do it now. Does it matter what the target is? Say, the mic, say, say that's a life support machine specifically. Well, that would be the idea of like you, that would be something you would have to talk through with the client and say, do you have someone that's there on that person making sure that this won't like cause loss of life or loss of, uh, I don't know, brain function for someone who's like on life support? Yeah. Okay. So are you saying that ethically it changes if that is a life support machine hooked up to a patient versus one where someone isn't hooked up? Yeah, like a dev or a well, for sure. Like, if loss of life is involved, that's a whole <laughs> other level of issue than like losing money in the middle of a, say, like last year's thing. If uh, actually that was a perfect example, last year's thing is a whole different case of oh yeah, um, like we're really really sorry. This was very bad. We crashed your database that stored like banking information. Or yeah, we're really really sorry. I think we're gonna go to jail. We just killed one of your clients. Okay, yes. so that's too totally different ethical issues. It is. So let's, so let's say instead of a life support machine, it's the uh, <laughs> stock exchange broker central component that manages all the trades. So you're losing like tens of millions of dollars every second that it's down. How do you feel about that one? <laughs> I'm speaking for substantially less numbers of people in the room as we go on. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to throw out an idea, right? Like if you get into a scenario like that and you talk to the client, you can explain the risk of the exploit. You can maybe try it on a dev system and then they could just put you at the level of access that you need. Exactly. <laughs> I, I think fundamentally the thing we're discussing here is talking to the client and getting their approval and feedback is really one of the most important parts of it. Because you as a pen tester aren't going to know if that system is hooked up to a human being that you could kill versus it's their dev. And not that there's ever a hospital that has a dev life support machine. <laughs> but if there was such a thing, that would be, you would essentially make an ethical decision as a pen tester to have the client tell you the right feedback. Now, if the client's wrong and that results into that, you still did something bad. But like from an ethical perspective, I think you've made the best effort to make the right decision in that case and have the client 
give you the guidance, and the client is the one that screwed up in that case. So communication is critical, and that's something that we are terrible at as an industry, both in teaching people and in just like fostering that expectation as you kind of go through things like DEF CON and everything else. We're like, we, don't, we don't talk about that much. One thing to point out, or at least bring up, is if you are getting that agreement from the client, Can make, a little I'm sorry, closer to if it. you are getting that agreement from the client, making sure to get it in writing and not verbally over the phone. Oh God, yes. <laughs> that that is an excellent point yeah. because yeah. if if something is oral, they can easily deny that. If yeah. it's written and their headers in the email come from their mail server, <laughs> <laughs> that that definitely makes it a lot more solid. Yes. Yeah, I'm just gonna confirm. Yeah, come come a little closer to the mic. Yeah, there has to be uh, um, the I guess terms of uh, what I'm sorry. Uh, the rules of engagement need to be defined. Um, and there is an operational risk, and it's up to both parties if they want to engage or not. Um, but when you're testing, like, the OT side of things or something critical where there might be um, loss of life, like, that is an option that uh, you, you're dealt with. And sure, it's an ethical dilemma, but you're going to do your best. I guess I wanted to add to this. I don't – I think I kind of disagree because it seems like the focus here is – more on passing liability or just contractual responsibility that, you know, if the other party acknowledges the risk, then we can proceed. I'd actually like the industry to approach it with more rigor in that, like, you do end up playing a part whether it's acknowledged or not, and you should be able to assess for yourself whether or not, like, if this down the line could end up harming someone, even if the, the contract that you have with the company you're working with gives you the okay. Like, we should still like take that for ourselves as like pen testers or like people within the cybersecurity community and be able to address that like separately from just like passing on the liability. I, I yeah, think that's, that's an amazing point. I see yeah. a lot of times in my business people defer risk. They will keep asking up the chain, what is this decision, what is this decision? And they don't often add some kind of analysis of like, hey, you know, maybe we can come together on this as a group or like, um, this is my opinion and this is how I vote in this situation and then send it up the chain. A lot of times I just see people deferring that responsibility, that risk to the next person so they don't have to. Yeah, a lot of times you'll see they don't necessarily want to have, they want to have a scapegoat pretty much as opposed to a solution. Yeah. Which we see that. That's a very good point. We see that a lot. And a lot of times, the, the pen test firm is the scapegoat. Yes. And so, I mean, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, another thing that comes into play in the actual competition, but you don't really capture it during these questions, is there's so much politics usually involved in a pen test, right? And like maybe the organization won't give them that access because they don't want them to see what's on the other side of that machine. Um, so I've seen that too, where the organization is resistant to the pen tester continuing to get access, which might cause them to try an exploit like this to find out what's out there. And the other thing I'd say is this goes beyond just pen testing. Uh, and even in general consulting, I've ran into this sort of thing where like, I've been blamed for taking down websites after doing a firewall upgrade when the firewall upgrade was canceled. So it's a whole thing where everyone is trying to look for someone to defer the blame to, and we really shouldn't be looking at just blaming. We should be just trying to solve problems. But what do I know? Just a consultant. Yeah. Next one. Well, before you go, you mentioned that you do role playing as part of the competition or game. Is there uh, any time that you've done this or plan to do it in the future to test ethics to maybe put a trap door in there, uh, a scenario <laughs> where you may come across in character to try to test that? And if so, if you're thinking about in the future, do you have an ethical obligation to let them know that that may be coming as a real world uh, experience that, that could come if they're you know pin testing for the more honorary organizations that are out there? That's a good news, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> you want to take it, Tom? Yeah, sure. Uh, so we have many things planned for the coming year and the following OSINT, year. OSINT, OSINT, OSINT. Yeah, <laughs> a little hint there. This and year, this year, this I year. I would say that we do not necessarily plan on telling the teams that they will be subject to this sort of thing. We expect them to operate professionally and handle things in a way that they think is best given their role as a pen tester working for the company that has hired them. 
So that without without you know delving too much into what we're planning on doing and what we aren't planning on doing, I would say that's absolutely something that is something that we want to teach. And and one of the things I will add as we're doing this, we are not trying to set them up to to fail. Um, so we will be giving in the process of that. One of the things we have been discussing at length is how do we do this in a way to give them every hint and every chance to succeed. So that it's not a, ha, 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 we got you. Did you learn? It's more <laughs> of an opportunity at every step to get something out of it. Right. And I think that's that's key. Our goal as the Pentest Advisory Board in particular, like we want students to come out of this because we want to hire them, right? And we want students that have these skills because right now what we've seen and the reason this all got started is because we're seeing that gap. People can come out and they can break stuff all day. I can – I have – people on my team that I can throw anything at them and they will be able to break it and it's amazing to watch but I cannot put them in front of a client at all because they have no concept of how to interact with the client in a professional way so we do a lot of coaching before the game on professionalism and what that means within the context of this competition and I appreciate that comment earlier about our language I don't know what a better way to, d to define this is so suggestions afterward would be awesome but um, we spend a lot of time with them, coaching them, what does this mean? And then repeatedly throughout, we expect you to behave professionally, professionally, professionally. But the problem is a lot of these students have never been in a professional environment, so they have no idea what that means really. And that, that's another thing that goes beyond pen testing, where if you are in a position where you're working with clients, you could be the best technical person in the world. But if I can't trust you to not be an idiot in front of a customer, I can't have you be the first impression. So that's something that we have to deal with beyond just as a pen tester, but just technically in general. So just to explicitly call it out, yes, we have ethical human interaction challenges this year. Yeah. He's not wrong. <laughs> and we now need to send an email to all the teams about that. Because we're ethical. Because they may not see this. <laughs> well, actually, that's a good question. No, no. no we're this is we're going to tell all the teams to watch the video for this. Yeah, so I guess that's maybe a good question here is from an ethical perspective. Do we need to email or provide direct? Because there are competitors in this room right now. I won't call I'm them out. No, you don't need to. <laughs> so I guess that is an ethical question of our should we is it unethical for us to just say leave it and not say anything and say the people that were here are, are in a better shape I, I think it's it's there but I, I actually think you could play the devil's advocate and make an argument of <laughs> you might have longer uh, no we did not so, we, but, we, we, we have told everyone that follows our Twitter that we are going to be here, and we have told everyone that is registered for the competition to look at our Twitter for news. And we, I, I plan on sharing this as an innocent thing. So as someone else who puts together competitions, uh, social media is a very poor mechanism yep. to share information, yep. especially with, if it in the context of being ethical. Um, if you're going to say you get an advantage and you get a disadvantage for being able to have access to something, that it, you're raising the bar of entry to the competition. So you've said you have access, you can do this, but now you actually mean you need to go all the way up here because you have to monitor social media accounts in addition to the social media accounts that are being given for the competition. Yes. So whether or not that's realistic, it's fun to, you know, put it out there, you know, here's this hint, but if those hints are going out there for something at such a big level, in my opinion at least, but for teams who have, are playing, they need those bits of information to help build the strategy. Yeah, you're saying it's like too desperate, too hard to access? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so that's, I think that's a great comment. He's saying the information there. is yeah. too desperate, <laughs> too hard to access, and we almost need to provide these lessons learned directly and I think do the like a thinner version of the OSINT. So, so do you think that if we were to say send an email to all the competitors with a list of things that they might want to consider looking at? Oh, that's perfect. Would that fine. be? You've just would that resolve that? Okay. Yeah, that, that was my question also. So, do you think we need to directly say, "Hey, there will be this type of challenge to be oh, ethical," or can we just say, "Hey, you might want to check out this talk"? So, 
I don't think saying spelling everything out for a team helps them. Um, after all, the idea of a competition is to help build the skills of a student participating. So, no, you don't have to spell it out, but giving everyone the same access to the information sets the, the entry level, and that's where a competition takes it from there. I agree with that. I agree with that. And I would say this talk aside, step out of character here for a second, we completely agree, but it's a good discussion, yeah. so. Uh, as a, an additional point, uh, yes, at, uh, access, but also uh, Inform them of the availability of it. If, yeah. You know, yes, it's available for anyone who happens to know the you you, you know the video. But I'm not going to put it out on Twitter. I'm not going to send an email to the teams because they've got to find it themselves. And that becomes really hard. To, you know, not good. But sending them out and saying, hey, here's the URL, and if they don't look, they're damn problem. Sure, right. right. So, so, so we don't have to provide the information directly, but we should provide the accessibility directly. Yeah. Fair enough. Cool. One of the one of the other things that's actually been coming up for us a lot as a board this year, now that we're in several years of this, is how do we also level the playing field with new schools mm -hmm. versus those that have played before? Yep. And that's a, a very serious consideration that we've had, and and actually a future slide that we'll <laughs> hopefully be discussing. But how do we deal with cases where you know some schools have more experience competing, plus there are people who have recognition of schools like you're gonna know like i'm looking in the audience i know there are people that have competed and i and you know competing. believe it or not we have a opinion of you <laughs> <laughs> we judge you yes <gasps> oh no <laughs> but, <laughs> we, we have a black flag being held up on that <laughs> yeah. Flag flag. yeah uh i think that this bit quickly kind of devolved into the first chapter of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Like, oh, well, yeah, the information's been on display in Alpha Centauri for the last four years. Why haven't you checked? <laughs> but uh, it goes a little bit back to the core idea. Like, you started off by saying, oh, yeah, this is a competition, but, like, we don't want people being competitive. We want this to be a learning experience. And that creates an interesting di dichotomy where you can say, like, if you wanted to provide out-of-the-way... Uh, information that only some people knew about and create like that insider's club that's really good from a competitive standpoint to have more people hunting for these things but it's not as good for learning and creating a broader uh, base yep. of professionals exactly. so, so that's interesting and I agree with you I guess the question that I have and since we do have so many competitors or previous competitors would you be interested if this wasn't a competition it was just billed as learn how this works was that something that would still hold your interest or no is the competitive part of it a key part do both <laughs> um, having done cyber defense side of things yeah. yes pen testing good um, we also had to publish curricula and say like look this is what you need to know this is you know here's all the information here's and we published uh, about six or seven weeks worth of curricula for them to go through for all schools. So that was our attempt to also level the playing field. Very good. So That's cool. I don't know if you guys do something similar, but suggest. It's a good idea. I, I think the networking opportunity between the student teams is one of the most fantastic aspects uh, of the entire, I mean, probably the pinnacle of the entire competition. What about getting them to work together? Yeah, I mean, like, so maybe it's still a competition, but maybe you split the teams and, you know, two, two, and two, or whatever, and now they have to work together. We I, were talking about some curveballs like that. Uh, uh, I would, I just, I would yeah. love that. Yeah, I, <laughs> I would absolutely, because then you, you're working with the, you know, these are the people you're going to, these are going to be your clients, these are going to be your customers, exactly. these are going to be your coworkers, this might even be your boss. Yeah. This is a very small community, despite having 30,000 people here at this conference. You know, let's let's uh, let's catalyze that opportunity to to, to mix and match. Yeah. Let me just say, with maybe not within the scope of the actual competition, like scoring points aspect of it, but there are things very very similar to what you're just saying in a Google Doc that we're using for planning. Oh great! Can so you sh can you share that with me? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What? Well, okay. We we will share it with you in November. I, I absolutely want to highlight that comment. Um, these students are going to be working with each other in the industry as much as us, but like the, they are peers. And it's a shame because I feel like the competitive aspect of it stops them from interacting as much as I wish they did. Yeah. Uh, I really, I would love it if 
team sat with each other, shared techniques, like kind of shared the stuff. But there's that competitive aspect where they don't want to reveal their hand. So the, yeah, I'd like to. There's that. there's a very firm plan for us to have more time to interact with the students, not only in a competitive but also in a professional manner. And I know you're going, and I'm, I'll give you a chance in just a second. But also, some of the things that we've done to try to kind of prevent that competitive nature is um, require things like you can't have private tools repositories. You can use whatever you want, but it's got to be publicly available so you don't have a separate advantage from other teams. So we try to even the playing field that way a little bit. And I also want to bring up, that's a really good idea, and it happens in the professional world. I've been on incident response engagements where they've brought in my company and another company, and we have to work together to find uh, the data. So it's a real world example that you're working with competing uh, companies and and to Jason's point, one of the rule additions that we've made for 2019 is allowing teams to use a repository that we provide for any tools that they develop. That is something that has to be public. They have to document it. They have to know how the tool works and be able to explain it to someone else. But it's our belief that if you create something for the competition that's going to be a contribution to the rest of the information security community, that shouldn't be something that's secret. So we want to make that something that we can share under the umbrella of CPTC, but further the community as opposed to just having teams hiding in their own circles, developing awesome tools that they don't want to share. and. We figured the best way to do that was to open that up and make it something that was allowed with certain restrictions. So personally, I come not from a CPTC background, but from the CCDC background. But I think the the idea still relates, which is imagine that I'm playing in the like a southeastern regional, and somebody else is playing in a different region. There is a very very low percent chance in which I am going to interact with teams that do not qualify from another region. And even the teams that don't even qualify for their region don't interact with anybody. So one of the things that we've been thinking about, and this is coming from, from previous work experience, and we've done this before where we said, we're going to work on a project with our entire group, the whole group, this whole department, the large department. Instead of it just being your little department that's in one location, you're going to work with, you have to work with at least another group that's in another location. So not only do you have to work with like your, in this case it would be your region, but also, you have to work with people from other regions. So you have to learn, here's how I work remotely, even. Like, how do I work with people that don't even live anywhere near me, may work in a different time zone, uh, cool. as That's well as possibly idea. saying, like, I need to work with people from other teams within my region, just to, like, increase the diversity of thought within, like, interregional ideas. That is an interesting idea. That's a really good idea. We'll have to figure out how to make that work. But I like your thoughts. So hopefully not going too far off topic, um, but that's just the, the whole point uh, of this. So that's no problem. <laughs> just, just trying to go from the focus of ethics, um, and I'm going to throw this back here. But if you are as competition organizers, as competition organizers, you th say, okay, now you have to, f you no longer have your team. You no longer have those people who you trained with, you you studied with, however you prepared. You are now split amongst. 10 teams. Congratulations. Is that something that is, to the context of a competition, is that something that's ethical? Is that to rip all the strategy and all that stuff and force teams <laughs> to do stuff that they don't want? Is that something that is actually ethical? So we just got a card for ethical and unethical. Come on up. <laughs> I think uh, before we do, I'd, I'd like to see. Uh, see everybody. Let's Inclu see everybody. Including us. Moss. Uh, so, can you restate, restate your question, please? Yeah. Would you yeah, want to restate your question? Restate the question. Sorry. Actually, here, I, I can do it. Is, it. is it ethical in the under the auspices of a competition to force everyone to randomly work with other people knowing that they have trained together? We even have some disagreement up here. <laughs> How would you score? Well, let, let's hear. I'd like to hear from the audience, from from one of each. Matt, get up there. What? Like a lot of us are millennials, we just think everyone wins, right? Well, if, oh, <laughs> bad joke. Bad. <laughs> yeah, whatever. If it's the NFL All Star Game, that's one thing. If it's competition, you're training as a team. The team is competing, not the individual. So, all right, now you get to work with different people that you've never worked with, but you're still being judged as a team. You have no control over who the other people are. You've never worked together. You know, you might, out of random luck, you might get 
you know, the lame-ass team. So, so to clear, for those that don't see your card, you're holding unethical cards. Yeah, I'm holding unethical. Okay. Okay. Just like the real world. For, yeah. Uh, that is why I held unethical, because I agree with that. I think if you train with a team, you should play with that team. Yeah. So but what about... If it's, oh. if it's a different thing like the All-Star game, which is not part of the regular season, it's like, <laughs> hey, let's have the crisp pick. And then they do a, you know, it's kind of a pickup game. That becomes ethical because it's not counted. Okay. It's more fun. So it's but basically the difference between the World Series and the All-Star game, or... Bingo. Yeah. yeah. So I'd love to hear from someone that said ethical. Yeah, so it's still in the, like in the context of like in the competition, like we are still like the our university team is this random team, or is just like we are brand new teams that we just I that think we are all brand new teams. So if we took one person from every team and all put them on this like a, a collective team, yeah, we, we shuffled all the teams. So I don't see any <coughs> issue with that because it's not like we're representing our university. Okay, we're representing this team that was just formed. So it's, we're pretty much all starting off the same like level playing field. So there's no. Like, yes, you may get someone that, you know, isn't as good, but basically everyone has that same percentage of risk where, like, they may get someone that's really good, someone that gets someone that's really bad. And overall, since we're not representing, like, our official university or whatever you're doing, um, I see no problem with it, especially since this competition this competition is for learning. So, like, I don't see, just because you train with someone doesn't mean that you can't work with another group, especially if you're not officially representing a university, I see no issue with it. And I've done this competition before, so. <laughs> yeah, and that's why I said ethical, too, because yeah. I, I kind of agree with that. I don't. I don't train as a team with my colleagues, right? It's all just a random grab bag. Uh, so it doesn't make a difference if I'm training with working with somebody in my company or some other company. I've never worked with them before anyway. And, and so the competition environment like CCDC where you're like, okay, we need a, somebody that knows Linux really well. We need somebody that knows Windows really well. And the, te- the teams do come in with that kind of breakdown, but that's not, that's not how it works in a company. Like, that's not how that works at all. And uh, to, hmm. to add to that, like in real companies, like, you're going to be pulled into, you have other teams pulled into your work, and you guys need to go, like, we have a detection monitoring team, and you have, I'm, I work in the IR team for whatever company I currently work at. We have instances where we're both working together, but even though we're still relatively close, like, we still have to interact with someone else that we usually don't, we don't do our day-to-day work with. Yep. We don't know what their skill level is. I really like do I know this person knows, like, what Plaza yeah. is? Can they do forensics? Can they do anything? Can they read PCAP? Do they know what logs are? So, like, you don't know, like, who you're working with, which is really sad. I, um, so. I wonder if it would change the internal dynamics of the team, because then you would get one person from each team at the school that won versus... Yeah. You know, a team that won. You could potentially have a scenario where where the team that won represents three or four different universities. Right. It and would be one person from every university. Yes, and it would be a new team. Yeah. But imagine the opportunity for cross pollination between these programs. There yeah. Are, many of these programs are focused in very specific areas. They have a very specific methodology or strategy. Um, if we can remove the barriers to sharing information and change the I mean, ultimately, somebody has to win one of these competitions by points. But if you look at these competitions, CCP, uh, CPTC, CCDC, ultimately you're actually com- not competing against each other. You're actually competing against some external entity, right? And in CPTC, yeah. you're competing against a red team. There is nothing in the rules. I'm not giving you guys any ideas here. C- but CPTC or CCDC? C- CPTC. There is, there is nothing in the rules that says, says that we can't collaborate Sure. Yeah. And so it be, it the same is true for in CCDC. You're essentially going up against a red team, yeah. and you're all kind of at the same starting block. There's nothing that says that blue teams couldn't collaborate together. To yeah. But but, but we approach this from a PVP point of view. And yeah. We need to switch, I think, to PVE. Right. And, um, yeah. I like that. And I think I, the I, opportunity <laughs> there would be. Uh, something really special. One of the reasons I really like that idea is because some of the schools that come into us don't have security programs. They've just got students that enjoy security and there's somebody on the faculty that is willing to work with them and kind of foster that. Yeah. And so they come in and they have they don't have that. Stanford exposure. has no undergrad security yeah. program at all. And and you're not yeah, unique yeah. amongst <laughs> other teams that ha- are similar. So and we've actually seen so we've seen schools recorded? that so, so we've seen schools that have strong yes, business programs do well in the event because they have the technical skills that people get out of passion just from working with it. And then they also have solid business skills that the technologists kind of suck at. So that that's worked but out we, really well. I mean, we've got this incredible diversity of poly, you know, outstanding polytechnical institutes, outstanding theory institutes, 
let's get these people together and start working together. Yeah, that could create lifelong friendships too. Like those people will probably trade information, you know what I mean? Stay in touch. The people that I've met through this, you know, this event and this competition are, you know, uh, they're, they're, they're going to be with me for the rest of my life. We love curveballs too, so we like getting <laughs> ideas. Um, I'm the director of the Michigan Cyber Range, and we've struggled with kind of leveling the playing field. I've hosted numerous competitions, and you know, how do you really level the playing field across teams? You can either one um, randomize the teams so you'd have a diverse team, or you can say, hey, pick your own team, kind of force that diversity upon them. Like you should, if you want to win, you need a diverse team, right? We all know that. So it's it's kind of you you choose your poison there, and um, we've hosted a bunch of exercises, as I said, and one of the things that we've done is kind of level the playing field by giving everybody the exact same operating system with all the same tools, right? I mean, that's another way of doing it. So um, it's, it's really, you know, it's an interesting problem. Um, in the end, you know, it's all about skill and experience for each team, right? So you can never really truly have this perfect um, um, level playing field, right? That's why you have winners, right? So anyway, thanks. No, and, and yeah, I mean, we do, so... The teams are all provided, all of the systems that they perpetuate their attacks from and start from are inside the virtual environment we build. So everyone does have the same image, but, but you're correct, right? There's a wide variety in skill sets and creativity and, and business and, and communication skills and writing. And, and it's, it's very tough to take that diversity um, at a level of where you have smaller teams. Do you give the teams access to the material from previous years? We haven't because they're branded, but um, they're branded by team, and we are working to provide some anonymity so that we can. And we also want to be able to release some of the things that we develop for the organization yeah. so that there's a library that other teams can use to prepare. And, and other competitions. Our tooling's public, but our secret sauce right now isn't, and uh, we are working on making it so that we can do that. But it's it's one of those things that happens in our free time, free time. Which is even smaller than our free time. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, so I'm glad that a lot of people seem to be bringing up concerns about the whole kind of information siloing aspect of this. Because you know, when you've got a team that's got, you know, years of a legacy with success at not just CPTC, but other yeah. competitions at well, as well, um, you end up in a position where they can just kind of get the snowball of success to such a size that it just like you know yeah. steamrolls everyone else. Um, and the what I've heard so far being brought up as far as forcing teams to kind of integrate together like with their rosters, I think that's an interesting concept, especially since that's something that people would see in like a real world scenario, like in different parts of a company. But I also think that there are ways for you guys to attack this from kind of the competition organization standpoint as well. Uh, for example, with re like releasing old materials from teams, like obviously that puts them at a disadvantage because, you know, their strategies for success, right, like those are going to get released. But at the same time, uh, that puts them in a position where they have to conscientiously decide mm -hmm. if that's a trade-off they want to make, right? Like, do they want to put that forward in a scenario where it's going to be eventually released uh, for the sake of winning this competition this year, right? Or in another example, maybe you want to split up the network environment where it's like team, like you'd get assigned to sort of collaborate with another team. You're not necessarily like integrating throughout the entire rank of one team. Like it's this is team A, this is team B. Team A is going to look at one part of the network environment that might have certain information pertinent to the other part. And then when it's time for the like the two teams to trade off they would then share different tools and techniques and information that they've found over the course of their assessment, at which point, like, they gain exposure to the other teams, like TTPs and things, and the, like, relevant information, and they're actually collaborating and working together. That's a, that's a really interesting idea, yeah. and that correlates to, like, when I go into a company and do a pen test, and they provide me, like, the last pen testing report that they had, and it was from a different company, right? So that'd be pretty easy to work into a real-world scenario. Let me ask you this question, though. We've never previously that I'm aware of told teams that we would make their their reporting, for example, even anonymized, public, would it be ethical for us to do that? Or is this something we should look at in the future and we make 
from here forward, we put something in that says this is something that will happen. We'd love to see the cards. I, I think like to retroactively go back and do that without their permission would be unethical, but if you get their permission, that'd sure, be fine. Yeah, right. And definitely yeah. like going forward, having a clause in that, yeah. totally fine. I just wanted to... Uh, I, I would have to say that I don't know if there's anything in the rules that would prevent us from doing that. Yeah, but as we've been talking about... <laughs> yeah. I just I wanted to add exactly. a quick note. That would take it like from PvP to PvE to cooperative, right? Yeah. Co-op. You know, they need to work together to solve the challenge. Yeah, so I really like that. Uh, two things. I guess so on the reporting side, I guess a uh, company like pen test reports, that is like part of their like identity. That's like their intellectual property. So yep, if, if, if you were to actually go and publish that, that would be pretty that'd be pretty bad. But another thing is um one thing that they did in C C D C at least starting like a few years ago, is that you, we have kind of like a threat intelligence exchange where the captains or people from each of the teams, they sit in like in a room for like an hour and they go and they talk about like Hey, what you see, and you basically give the other blue teams, you know, things like, oh, I saw this on this box doing this, et cetera, et cetera. Cool. And that was something I think they implemented last year. So I, that could be really cool if you guys could impl- think of something how you would um, implement that, at least in terms of CBTC, like some sort of like, you know, the techniques or procedures, like tactics, like, hey, we discovered some sort of vulnerability on this box. Or we- what about a forum? A forum would be good. I think a forum would be good, like an open forum for like 30 minutes where, you know, one of the whatever the product manager who are the lead consultant is goes and you know, talks about what they found or like it kind of gives like a short summary like a of overview. Yeah. So very good ideas everyone has. Well, first, good to hear that someone actually liked that uh, that implementation that we uh, put in. Um, <laughs> but we never really hear feedback. Um, but um, the other thing is um, with a similar you know topic, if you. We all are talking about whether it's okay when things aren't documented and for ethics of competitions and things like that. Is it ever okay, and obviously the whole room um, um, can answer this one, but is it okay that for us when as a competitor you your strategy is to find the little details and everyone who's competed, you know, you're looking for those in the rules where it misses that one word, where it, 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 there's this little piece of information that you can just sneak by so you can get a strategy that is successful. And everyone's laughing because they know it's true, but that's how a competition works. At least these competitions work. Now, hold we, on. I'm, I'm going to find something real quick. Okay. Here we go. Oh, I thought just a bunch of screens. No, no, really no, no, no. This, th- this is what we've added to the rules. <laughs> <laughs> Good job keeping that. Can I take a picture of it? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's on our website. I, I get what you're saying, Joe. I, I competed in a, an event in college. It was like my last week of college. It was called The Great Race. We had to build these robots, and I hacked the competition. I, uh, we couldn't change the motors, and we were fixed on the, these axles, and I changed the wheel size, so my robot went way faster than everybody else's robot. Uh, it's basically like mechanical gear ratios, right? Anyway, the... We won on a technicality because we hacked the rules, and I felt bad afterwards because I looked at everybody else, and it, it wasn't fair. You know what I mean? We we found a flaw in the rules, and we took advantage of it, and it wasn't the same competition. Yeah, the the CCDC team I was on at RIT is responsible for some rules at the national level. So, <laughs> uh, that that that's part of the things that are going through our heads when we're actually trying to develop this sort of thing, and that's. Honestly, the reason we have something like this that we've added. So, so those nuances, we can say, we know what you're trying to do. It's not something that's professional, and we don't want that to happen. There, there was a second half to this, and that is that, you know, we know as organizers that teams are doing this. Um, we know that they're trying to find a way around the rules. Um, when we do find those, how, like, I know this, there's no clear-cut answer, but as organizers, do we... If we're going to be completely ethical, then the rules must state if you have violated the rules and we've deemed you violating the rules, like you're, what you say, then you must be disqualified or you know punished in some way because that is how the rules work. Mm. However, in the reality, like it, it's hard because sometimes it's it's unknowing, it's accidental, and that's what this whole talk is you know about. So I'm just throwing that out there. How do we as organizers find that balance in our own policies to update them and make them better before we make something that's 100 pages of rules? <laughs> so just just a thought. I, I was just going to say it's, it's a... 
it's a gray area and that's why I like to take the soft approach because it's a learning opportunity for us even as we go through these scenarios. So like I like to give people the benefit of the doubt and I don't always assume malicious intent and I try to make it a learning opportunity rather than like a you're kicked out thing. And I, we, I would agree. Oh, yeah. go ahead. Oh, I would agree on the professionalism side. It's how the team interacts with us in character when something like this would come up. And that's that's an advantage that we have that maybe CCD does not have because our focus isn't just on technical, can you keep it up, can you find the holes, can you do all this stuff. In fact, that's not even the bulk of the scoring. The bulk of the scoring is your report, how you're interacting with the team during the uh, – with the with – the, um, CBTC team during the engagement and it's those soft skills and so it, it, it's a little bit we have a little bit less of a problem there I think than some other schools where it, it's kind of I want to find the technical rules because you can't find technical problems with soft skill right it's a little harder to do and the, the other thing that I would add, at least what we have tried to do, our approach thus far has been that uh, we look at rule violations by committee, by advisory board. And sometimes, in fact, we'll even bring some of our sponsors in, maybe not read them into every intricate detail or who's responsible, but to ask their opinion and almost go a yes, no, where are we at? Um, and I think that's probably one of the, the stronger pieces we have to this as well is just we and there have been some times we have been vehemently disagreeing with each other um, but we generally come to a consensus I, I can't think of a situation where we voted in the end um, so and but it, there's very strong debate but there may be very strong <laughs> aggressive debate and I guess just to directly answer your question it has resulted in rule changes yeah. so that we can address it yeah, because we we want to make it a valuable educational experience. We don't want people looking for things that we screwed up in not accounting for in the rules with the comma in the wrong place or something like that. We're not lawyers. But realistically, if you're actually doing this in the real world, whatever the customer wants is what is the end game. So if the customer decides they don't like you or didn't like the work that you did or you did something that you know was against – Whatever they decided they cared about, that doesn't matter if you're right or wrong. It's what the customer thinks. And we're the customer ultimately in this uh, event. Uh, I just want to say yeah, rules of engagement is super important, important and you have to be explicit the entire time. And One of the things I've started to dabble with is kind of putting in a disclaimer at the end saying, my rules of engagement may evolve during the course of the exercises mm -hmm. because of unforeseen bullshit that can happen, right? So, it, <laughs> you know, you can't just say, here are the rules of engagement. You Technical need to phrase term, that right? a little bit differently in a professional it, term. Exactly. Like, if a team put that in their report, we might dock a few points. So we just call it uh, technical terms. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that's interesting, though, because as a pen tester, I hate when a client does that. Yeah. Right. I come in, and I, that rule of engagement is what I'm coming in as, and I can't stand it when a mm -hmm. client does that. So... I don't disagree with you, and it's not a professional environment. It is a comp competition, so yeah. there's it's not the same thing. But in a world like this where we're trying to emulate the real world, I almost feel like we shouldn't do that. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's take that to the audience real quick. Yeah. Let's, let's take that to the audience. So you're contracted for a pen test, um, and then they change the rules of engagement mid-pen test on you, uh, ethical, unethical. Mm. There ethical yeah. or pain in the ass. Right, there's, right, a big right. there's a big difference between. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Well, <laughs> okay. Now. Change it without a group. Do you, want to keep you, want, you want to go up and talk about that really quick? Yeah. Because this is. We've done pen tests, and the customers, in halfway through the pen test, they're like, oh shit, don't do that network. Because, you know, we forgot that that shouldn't be there. You know, that subnet's not owned by us. Um, and also, as part of our pen test, I mean, previous question, we popped a fetal heart monitor. That was connected to a patient. We freaked the hell out with the moment we knew what it was. Yeah. Talk to them, and they're like, oh, no, no, it's okay. And we're like, mm -mm, we're not going to do it. And pulled that out of the statement of work because we're not going to do that and that's made awesome. it as a separate statement of work, not connected to a patient kind of thing because it terrified us. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So, so one of the other scenarios we actually had was uh, that I think would be is, is very pertinent to this is client asks you to remove something from a report. Not just change in scope, but first before we before we put that out there, how many of you have been in that scenario in your professional life? Yeah, change of scope happens. No, not change of scope. You've got a, a vulnerability on a report. 
and the client comes back and says, we don't want that on the oh, report, yeah. take it out. You almost have an ultimate yeah. head tester. Like, you right. know, as a doctor, like, yeah. it's going to affect tens of thousands of people. What are you going to do? Yep. Yeah. So, but what if it's not, we want you to remove this. What if it's, I have all these mitigating factors that we haven't tested, and I think it should be reduced from maybe a 10 to a 5? <laughs> That's what we're here for. <laughs> what if we didn't test that? That's a that's a very good, I like very good. Oh, so the uh, thank you. The comment was, "What if they fixed it after we tested it?" Like, do you still report it? You're saying? Yeah. What if they fix it? We retest it, and it's completely fixed. Do we still report on it? So before the test is done. Before the test is over. Yeah. That's a so good one. I like that. They're doing their due diligence. Um, was it too late? You know, no. the, 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 the stakeholders need to know that they weren't doing their due diligence in time. You know? right. So let cards. Remove it from a report. Ethical, unethical. Unethical. It, it almost depends. Redu okay, so let's 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 go with some of these others. Reduce reduce the risk rating. Quick quick question. Does it repent? Does it depend who the report is for? Like if it's just for the client, just for a or public. Yeah, I, I actually don't think so because it would be used internally. Okay, but that's my opinion. I, uh, my opinion is similar to that though. Yeah. So what about reducing the risk? Right. What about removing it after we retest it and find it has been resolved? By removing. That's a new date on the Yeah. So I can tell you how I handle that on my reporting is we leave the finding. When we find a finding, the finding's there, period. Um, if you mm -hmm. mitigate it or if you have other factors that reduce the risk, we'll note that in the documentation. We've yes. actually got a special section for client response, and we also have uh, um, like fixed things. So we'll add notes, and we'll change the status from like uncategorized or whatever to fixed, but it's on the report because it was a finding when we were there. Yeah, at the point in time that you did that, that's Correct. Can I just make a comment about the going back to the rules? Um, I, so I think the, this violating the spirit of the competition is the key here. And there have been things that we've found or done where we internally voted it down, that it was not something we were going to do because it violated the spirit, even though it might have been we could have gotten away with it. So I think there's some expectation that teams self-police on this. I know this is the real world, but we're all adults, and uh, there should be an expectation that you're professional and that you self-police on these things. That said, um, there is a certain beauty in creative approaches, and uh, I would just encourage you guys to not write so many rules or become so draconian or uh, stringent that it weeds out that creativity. And um, in some of the competitions, some of the most interesting work that we've done uh, in preparation for a competition and during the competition is uh, creativity around uh, gaining a competitive advantage and going right up to the edge of the rule but not crossing over. And uh, <laughs> they learn more from doing this than they would learn from learning how to instantiate local firewall rules as quickly as possible or you know, change all the passwords as quickly as possible and remove everybody from domain admins. I mean, we all know how to do that. Uh, we can all script that. Uh, that's kind of passe. So don't lose the, comp you know, the creative aspect of this that uh, forces people to think about things in new ways and, and, uh, and iterate and evolve. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And at the end of the day, as pen testers, that's what we're paid for is our creativity, right? Mm -hmm. That's when I'm hiring people, that's what I'm looking for is can you think broken and can you apply that creativity in a professional environment? And that's what we're trying to foster. And I think most of the teams are similar to yours. They all do a really good job self-policing. And one thing that I really enjoy about this competition in particular is that it is very um, kind of community all the teams competing have that kind of community, so at least from my perspective, they do, um, where it's like we enjoy doing this and we're here together to learn, not kill each other. I think the openness and uh, you know, uh, flexibility and approaches is a, is a key reason why you know, any team can be successful in this engagement. There are many possible ways to win this competition, and uh, I would say don't, don't rule, you know, create so many rules that... Mm -hmm. that uh, takes away that incredible uh, facet of the definitely, definitely. And, and I would say part of the reasoning for 
the rule that allows teams to use publicly available tools that they create is to kind of, yes, we are seeing scenarios where some of that creativity would be the intent of maybe not using or making it clear that they're using something that they pre-staged, for example. And this is actually an area that you and I debated quite a bit on Mm -hmm. how we wanted to approach it. But our philosophy was, yes, you would be potentially running into a scenario where teams are being very creative and getting around potential detection mechanisms or something in order to get an advantage, kind of scooting around what the rules might allow. And our thought was to make that a much wider scope of what was allowed to make, you know, remove some of the barriers at Tantry, remove some of the secrecy, and increase the collaboration. Yeah, I mean, you know, in the professional world, if you are if you're doing defensive expertise because you think everybody's going to learn your secrets, you don't know that much. I mean, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, just let, like you're you're not making your own encryption. <laughs> no. Yeah. Exactly. So open this up, level out the playing field, and let the best team win. I, I do want to just add, I think, uh, you know, we have all these issues up here and, you know, we've had issues with teams, but at the end of the day, I can't think of a single team that I've really had a negative overall experience with. They do self-police. They are amazing. Um, It's, yeah, it's been a great experience. And there have been so many times, myself, Lucas, all of everyone here have been walking around and we've been approached by students who have gone through this program and are just raving about how much it has been a positive impact on their career and experience. And that is the best, most touching thing for me to have that positive impact on people's lives. Okay. Um, With regards to what the last gentleman said about the fetal heart rate monitor, would you guys as the clients ever ask the students as the pen testers to perform something unethical? Like, say, uh, phishing was allowed. Are they allowed to only fish? Like, what does that mean? Is it just company email addresses, personal Gmail accounts, their kids? How far do you go? So last year we had an insider threat scenario, and the insider threat actively tried to get people to uh, delete data, destroy data, to kind of cover his tracks. And many of the teams reported this to a, like, we had this uh, other investigator, this, like, third-party investigator that we were bringing in. Many of the teams reported this. Some of the teams took the data back to the guy. Um, So we have, we've asked them in non-direct ways to do unethical things, like, through this, like, insider threat guy. But in in the case of, let's just say there was an environment where there could be something that could be completely unethical that could be somehow within scope or be considered appropriate for the pen test, we may totally ask the teams to do that. And unlike some other events where, you know, saying no is frowned upon, we would actually appreciate if the teams were to say no about that. And this is not ethical. We don't want to do this. This is why. And that would be actually something that would result in the teams getting points. And doing what we ask would be putting the teams in a position where they're doing the wrong thing and losing points. See, I was just going to say the exact opposite to that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, like, specifically that scenario of you've got something in the scope and you find out, oh, I am not okay testing this specific thing. That's an interesting idea to put that in. I think we could, and I think we mu- maybe should put it in just as an exercise, but I don't think I would want to score that. I, I really, I do like it from the perspective of somebody in a position of authority, yeah. right? Somebody that's your boss telling you to do something you are not comfortable to do. I really like that scenario. But because that, that, that happens to us professionally. Yeah. And it's, where but, clients try to say, you know, I'm the client, I'm important, you're doing this, and we have to push back on it. And, and then that is where one of the things that we have to do in the competition, though, is to determine, as Dan said, is this scorable or not? If we are, if we are setting up a teachable moment that <coughs> is, we feel like the majority of the teams are going to have a difficult time with, the way we score it may be very different. Um, because our intention is to teach, but we still are running in a, a competition, a game. And, and although we, I know we've talked a lot about how do we message this, how do we, what words do we use. So I was trying to think as I'm sitting here a better way to say this. Um, we do keep that in mind as we're going through this process as well. Yeah, and I think 
in some cases it's it, it's pretty black and white right you and out, outside of scope we have a defined scope that's pretty pretty black and white we can score that because it, it's pretty clear what the ethical implications there fetal heart monitor i feel like that's pretty black and white i think most of us here felt like that was pretty black and white but yeah. again as soon as we flipped that scenario a little bit and now it's just money that's involved suddenly we started getting differing opinions and i think if you put the students in that position that's where i don't think i would want to score their responses but i think it is a useful teaching experience and something like that where we're trying to teach something and almost expecting the students to not pick the right thing that is one of those things where we have a duty to make sure we communicate that teaching experience afterwards uh as part of like the wrap-up of the event or something like that where everyone gets to see this is why we did this this is what we wanted to teach this is how we think you should handle that professionally because they're going to face that later in their careers do we want to cover one more scenario yeah yeah so we've got about 10 15 minutes left like here so so do you like do you like this one the, the no, this Mallory triage, Mallory triage? Yeah. okay yeah okay you want to do okay. that, Dan? So this was a really interesting event. Um, it was during our healthcare thing. We had some sponsors build part of the infrastructure, and they in this infrastructure, they planted malware, and they had a breach, and they didn't tell us about it as the competition organizers. And in the role that I was playing, I was playing the director of incident response. Um, and basically, I had multiple student teams bring this compromise to me, at which point I didn't think we put this in the environment. So it, originally I didn't believe them. I said, you need to bring me evidence and convince me of this, otherwise you're kind of wasting my time. Um, and specific teams, they, they didn't just bring me evidence, they had a conver they, they showed me the evidence, but they had a conversation um, that was just different than the way other teams handled it. They would show you the evidence, they sat down, they explained what they found, and it was undeniable. It was like really a good experience for me, because then I was like, holy crap, this is here. I gotta go tell every other team that found this that they're right. Um, so the idea is, how do you how do you tell a client something when you have evidence and you know they're convinced you're wrong but you're right? Um. So just just to get some feedback from those of you who do this, have you ran into a situation before where you found something the client doesn't believe you, and how do you handle that? I mean, this, this is a regular regular thing that we deal with, um, which is, well, we, we issue a report, and it's, you didn't do that. Well, uh, we did. We have the evidence for it. No, you couldn't have done that. We would have caught you. So, and, and this also goes back to, like, some of my firewall admin days, where half of my job was fixing firewall problems, and the other half was proving it wasn't a firewall problem. Yeah. yeah. And it, it's the same kind of thing. You can't just walk into client and tell them, no, believe me, I'm right, you're wrong, you're an idiot, because they're not going to be a client anymore, even if you're right. So I think Lucas provided the key there, taking it outside of the context of malware and just putting it in the context of providing a client with evidence that whatever you say you did, you did, and how do you handle that, that when they're con coming back and saying, no, you didn't do that? How do you handle that? I mean, for me, it seems pretty clear. Cause I, like, I just I document it and say, "There you go. Here's here's your CEO's email. Yes, I did." <laughs> yeah, the the team that had convinced me of this, like they basically sat me down in the room and they were like, "Yeah, check it out. It's like right here." And I was like, "Oh crap!" And then they're like, "This is the system it's on." Whereas other every other team just told me, right? They were just like, "Yeah, you know, your own. There's malware in the environment." I'm like, "Where?" You know what I mean? This team like they're like, "Hey, come here. Check this out. Sit down." So I think this may go into the bigger role of. What is the actual role of the offensive team? Is it to document the results or is it to convince the company that they, their results are correct or rather that their results are fully actionable? So is their job to, to push change within the company or to show that there is a problem and that the company should enact change? I think that's another one where the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, from my perspective, I feel like it's our responsibility as consultants, right? Because as pen testers, we are consultants. So it is our responsibility, at least in our work, for, for my part of the world to raise the bar and make increase the maturity of my client and help them understand their risks. Mm -hmm. So if I am not doing that, I am doing them a disservice. And I have had multiple engagements over the years where a pen test has become incident response in that. I, I think that was the, the subtle difference here. Um, 
where the finding of the malware would trigger an incident response process that would kind of stop the pen test. I get what you're saying, though. Normally, you would just put it in the report, and you're just presenting the evidence and driving the changes up to the company to, like, believe it or do something about it, right? Mm -hmm. But here, the as the director of incident response, I said, if you find a compromise, let me know immediately so that we can do something, right? And basically, I multiple people were like, hey, this is compromised, and I just didn't believe them, I didn't have the evidence, et cetera, um, which happens all the time in IR, right? Like, you get people saying, this is weird, this is funny, this is an alert. You dig into it with the, you know, things they give you, and it might not be, right? I mean, I've I've had also situations, it, it's very situational, right? What do we put in the report and we leave for later, and what do we run into the client's room screaming and yelling, hey, you need to fix this? And, right. and, and it might be, I've had a client where they've messed up their NATs and every single port on every single host that they have in their DMZ is wide open to the internet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we tell them about that pretty quick. But if it's a uh, and some sort of inject on an internet accessible website that really doesn't get me to any information or data, then, well, that one is a tougher, tougher call. Mm. And maybe at that point, the question at least coming from the competition side would be, at what, how much do you want to push the team to try and argue that their point is correct? So if you're having a comp, if you as the as the organizer say like we're gonna make give, we're gonna make them argue that this thing is true and we're not gonna believe it for a while. So how far do you push them? Do you push them like a little to say like oh no we don't believe it and then they come back with some evidence and okay we we starting to believe this or is it like we don't believe this come back with like your dictionary of everything that you come up with and that, that's and it's yeah that's the line and yeah. it's not how much do they push us it's how do they do it mm -hmm. right and it was the elegance of the soft touch of sitting us down and showing us rather than pushing evidence on us and you know having it uh to be like adversarial and this this comes down to language too where you're using the word argue there's different definitions of argue or nuances to that and Argue as in, you're wrong, believe me, damn it, is not the argue we were looking for. <laughs> but argue in the sense of providing evidence and helping the client logic and reach the conclusion that we're hoping to achieve, that, that is exactly what you're going with, Dan. Yeah. And, and I think the, the, from a teachable perspective, because I think there was a component of that in your, your, your comment as well, I, I really feel like, so as, as everyone has said, I, I play the pain in the butt part of the client a lot or the aggressive portion or the, the, the angry bad cop whatever you want to call it and there may be a push really hard but then someone else from our team may come in and provide some support mm -hmm. so again there's teaching but then education there's the the expectation here's a hard lesson and then someone immediately comes behind or 20 30 minutes later to say hey we need to get this together the boss was upset when he came in or hey the engineer was upset but let me talk to you about what we actually need mm -hmm. so there there is certainly some some lines and we push them in different ways and I'll be honest, a lot of times we, we are doing and making those decisions um, on the fly, and that's why, again, we have a, we, no, we don't really go into rooms alone. We're talking with people, and then we, we actually do gut checks as we leave, and we're walking from team to team to say, okay, we need to keep this consistent amongst all the teams. Now, how do we, what do we need to do to go back to maybe change how we approach this for everybody? And, and there's a, a, it's very dynamic how we do this. And I think the competition and the, the, the process allows us to do that, which is cool. But we have to be very self-aware in it as well. And I think ultimately you're right. If you believe something, you should push for it. Yes. And it's our responsibility to run it to ground. I think we have time. We could probably do a quick scenario. We got one more, I think. Which which one do you want to do? Let's do the, the next one. Okay. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this one. So one of the things, this isn't something that's actually occurred for us yet, but it's something we've been talking about a lot. Is So we have these coaches. They're full-time employees, professors, um, engineers, administrators. You know, we have a lot of different folks that are the representative from the university that comes with their team, right? You have to have an FTE come uh, and, and join them uh, from well, certainly a liability perspective. But we also then have this unique opportunity to have 
people and leaders from around the country and around these universities on site with us together. And so the first couple of years, we actually tried to do like a, a little conference for them and have everybody, each one of the, the coaches bring something to present to the others. And um, one year, actually, they just said, can, can we just work? We just want to work. We're here. Let us hunker down and, and just work. But what we actually did last year is, is we gave them access to the environment after a uh, part of the environment, uh, basically the regional environment while the students were doing nationals. Team 11, uh, coach team. Yep, we had team 11, the coach team. And uh, they actually really enjoyed that. But we've had a lot of internal debate on, from the perspective of a coach, are we creating an ethical dilemma on the coach where maybe they identify something and even though we are all professionals, they are now in the dilemma of can they inadvertently, maybe not maliciously, but inadvertently help their team as they're at dinner or as they're talking about things. So from our perspective, what we are going to do is we're gonna try and make it so that the coaches now get a year delay. So they will get last year. But I think there's some good conversation around, even if it's accidental, what are, what are the, some of the ethical dilemmas in that? So, so first, let's see, coach team, uh, if they have an older environment, is that ethical or unethical to the competition? Pretty easy, hopefully. What if they have the same environment, ethical or unethical to the competition? Would somebody who marked ethical and somebody who marked unethical want to talk? <laughs> let's start with ethical. Ethical, unethical. So, wait, so what's like the delay between you guys giving them the environment and then us actually competing real time let's say yeah we gave them the same time you all started all right so i personally don't think it matters because when you go to write the report you have to have supporting evidence anyway and so by the time we finish our day if even though they may know something we still have to write the report and if we don't have evidence for it it didn't happen so so but we don't control okay i see your point yeah so like even let's say let's say you know we go through our days, our, our coach is like a super god, whatever, hacking, which is not true, by the way. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just putting it out there, for the record. Um, so let's say he's like, you know, he turns like a super hacker god, you know, you know well, like three, one, three, seven, you know, zero days all day. And he, he like, Don't forget, hacks. we're going to email this out now. That's fine. <laughs> go for it, I don't care. Right, he goes and hacks everything, and he's like, all right, guys, I got all the cheat codes, here's what happened, everything here. And, and he tells us, you know, the night of we're writing the report, well, it doesn't really matter because when we don't have screenshots, we don't have evidence, we can't prove that we did it, and we can't tell the client, like, hey, we know there's a vulnerability in your environment. Sorry, but we can't tell you how we did it, how we found out about it, or proof that we actually exploited it, but it's there. It's awesome. But, so. but what about if you have evidence of something, but you don't have a great way to substantiate that? What do you mean? Like... Well, not evidence. You, you, you they know, write something and they don't substantiate it. it well, no, what if... What? No, let's just say... You were competing. Yeah. You you found that there was something there, but you mm -hmm. couldn't necessarily explain why. But your coach figured it all out. We found something and we couldn't explain why. And yeah, it yeah. Like the there's evidence of something. You or you have a hunch. Mm -hmm. You have some screenshots that could be somewhat crafted to potentially indicate that. Well, then that would us being that us that we be unethical for lying. <laughs> because, you know, you can't have a you can't write a hunch in a report. You can write like. We believe, you know, X, I, Y, and Z happened. I, I can say that evidence. teams have definitely tried to write hunches. Yeah, yeah so, and they're not going to get points for that. So the the technical <laughs> the technical scoring happens with just a couple of us, and it's it's those of us that are not that we all don't do pen testing, but there's a couple of us that are super hardcore, ri ridiculous people, uh, and yes. uh, <laughs> they are. the scoring comes comes down to us. And I can tell you. There's a whole lot of hunches in those reports that we go through, and none of them get scored. And so what happens a lot of times is the teams will get see their scores, and they see the technical, and they're like, we had way more findings. And we're like, yeah, but none of them counted because you didn't evidence. put any evidence in, and it does not count as a finding exactly. if you don't have that evidence. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, well, at, least, at least on our end, like, we only put things that we have, like, 100% verifiable proof and screenshot for. Even there are things that we even redact out of our reports that we can't, we don't have enough supporting evidence for it. Thank so, you. Yeah, so, like, if you don't have the we proof appreciate for it, you. It doesn't really matter because you can't put something that you know you believe happened in a report. It's not true, and no one's gonna like that. So. I think we have so, like one. So we've minute. got about one minute left. So uh, I know they're sorry, Alex. We need yeah. to. We, we, we can, can talk after. We can talk after, but we'll, so 
there's a couple of real world lessons we wanted to talk through here. I think, you know, bringing this all together, the human element is very important. Um, how we handle some of these disagreements and attitude are probably just as important for those of us in the real world as the uh, way and how and the technical information on what we approach. More importantly, we as the educators of this competition are trying to teach people speaking skills, interpersonal skills, and, and so we, we, we've talked about this a lot, right? It's not a competition, except it is. And so this is something that we are constantly, constantly debating. Um, I don't know if you guys have any other closing comments on this. Otherwise, I, I, I really do want to call out that uh, seventh bullet specifically about remember who you're working for. We will see often teams will present and say, your IT staff sucks. <laughs> and like for me, role playing the role of the customer and you're just telling me that I hired shitty people. You're you're fired. You know we don't want to see that sort of thing, and yeah. that is a, a very valuable learning experience to have. How do you approach those sorts of situations where yes, maybe your client, your customer isn't all that good, and they have poor security practices, but how do you present that in a way that's appropriate for the audience and the management of those people that are making poor decisions? Uh, just closing remarks, I wanted to thank everybody that came here. I got a ton of great notes that I'm going to incorporate back into our yeah. OSINT program. So uh, thank you for your thoughts and your comments because I, I thought we had a great discussion and it, uh, I'm going to digest them and actually apply them. Yeah, this was so, a phenomenal audience and we really appreciate your participation. So, so last couple things here. Um, if you want to get involved, we'd love to have you. We need to build... Profiles. We need to write. We need to uh, grade reports in the fall. We are in the process of building the 2019 infrastructure. We're in the process of planning the 2020 competition. So if you want to get involved, this is a call to action. If you want to go to the, the next slide. Um, you know, be an ethical influence. This is this is our really final comment here. Is is be the, the influence that we want to be, right? The whole purpose of this competition, and this is our minus the little edit here, is essentially our mission statement is to be an influencer and an educator to create the next generation of cybersecurity professionals. That is the goal of CPTC. Now, we also need to be ethical about it, and, and that is really what we want to do. Uh, so we'd really like to hear from you on either ideas that you've got or if you'd like to get involved. Uh, for prior competitors, we, we, we love you the best, so you know what you've been through. If you are no longer a student and full-time, we'd love to hear from you as well. But anybody in the, in the audience or anyone that you know that you think might want to get involved, we have regionals all over the country, uh, but we actually run the infrastructure, and we run everything for them, and, and we create all of that. So. We need people in person. We certainly can always use money, but we're actually pretty good there. Uh, really, right now, we just need people to help us build. We're building a bank, and you should see what people's reaction is when I say, yeah, I'm just building a whole bank today. <laughs> it's pretty fun. <laughs> yeah, we, we actually end up spending uh, between probably the core group of 20 people or so about 10,000 hours a year building this. And so. We can use people across the board. If you're technical, if you're non-technical, yep. if you're a project manager, if you like marketing, whatever. We have a job for you. Yeah. It, the thing we were joking, Lucas and me, that the core group that runs a lot of this is smaller than a lot of the teams, yeah. which is, is insane. But without the support of everyone else who donates time and their talents and all that, we can never make it happen. So thank you all for coming. Uh, we really appreciate it, and we'd love to talk to you. So we'll be uh, outside, I think, yes? And grab stickers before you leave. <laughs> all right, thank you very much, yes. <laughs>